Hi, welcome to more Orthodoxy. This is Chandler Dedicated Catholics, Orthodox and Protestants alike. Today I'm joined by Dr. Richard Beck. Richard Beck is an author, a speaker, a blogger, and a professor of psychology at Abilene Christian University in Texas, USA. Every Monday, Richard leads a Bible study for 50 in inmates at the maximum security French Robinson prison uh, unit. On his popular blog, Experimental Theology, Richard will spend generous amounts of time writing about the theology of Johnny Cash, the demonology of Scooby-Doo, or his latest Bible class and monsters. <laughs> so um, just to begin, Richard, I would love to talk to you about your book, The Slavery of Death, um, which I think would be of interest to many Orthodox people in particular. Um, according to Hebrews, as you show, the Son of God appeared to break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those, um, all those who are held in slavery by their fear of death. What does it mean to be enslaved all of our lives to this fear of death? Um, yeah, so my interest there in that text is probably familiar to Orthodox who work from a kind of a Christus Victor theology of redemption or atonement, where Christ's victory over uh, dark powers, uh, Satan, sin, and death. And so obviously, the Orthodox focus on the harrowing of hell uh, during the Easter celebrations. Um, and my interest in it psychologically in this text is, is how in some translations it describes the power of the devil as a, a lifelong slavery to the fear of death. And so for your listeners who aren't familiar with my work, I'm a psychologist, not a theologian, and I'm not a pastor, but I'm a psychologist very interested in existential, what's called existential psychology. And obviously anybody interested in existential psychology focuses a lot on death anxiety. And so when you read a text that talks about uh, the, the fear of death or a lifelong slavery to the fear of death, that obviously gets a psychologist's interest there. Um, and so, so when psychologists talk about the fear of death, what, one of the frameworks I, I work with is a Freudian distinction between basic anxiety and neurotic anxiety. And so a basic anxiety uh, related to death anxiety is just survival anxiety, uh, your fight or flight response. And that is often triggered by perceptions of scarcity or threat or danger. And so whenever we're feeling threatened, and not just ourselves physically, but e even our situation in life, our, our livelihood. So we might not describe this as death anxiety but like if you don't have enough money to pay the bills if you're living in very precarious economic situations then that that's a that's an anxiety but it is a scarcity anxiety but it's rooted as it's a death anxiety ultimately because your your well-being your, your your survival or your ability to care for yourself and those you love is being triggered um then the other kind of anxiety is neurotic anxiety so if so when I talk about the fear of death with maybe Western in a, or affluent peoples, they might say to themselves, well, we don't, our affluence has buffered us from a lot of those threats. Now, by the way, all of this has changed during COVID. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the death anxiety is now through the roof. But prior to the COVID, a lot of wealthy people would say, I don't, I'm not very existential. I don't think about death a whole lot. But I, but they do think a lot about status. They, they do think a lot about uh, comparing themselves to other markers of success. So maybe their neurotic death anxiety, and this is now the, the, the thirst for self-esteem or significance, uh, a significant life, that, that maybe their death anxiety isn't about paying the bills, but it's, it's manifesting as uh, excessive competitiveness, uh, excessive workaholism, um, because you're trying to achieve and trying to, make you know uh worry about some sort of standard of success so the way i describe this fear of death is this distinction between survival and self-esteem one death gets to us either through a survival impulse to take care of ourselves and our resources or a self-esteem impulse to live a significant meaningful life in the face of death and and so it, depending on who we are it's obviously some mixture of the two and that the argument is that through those anxieties that that slavery to those fears that is what the devil uses, however you conceive of the devil, to manipulate us towards selfish or self-serving practices in the world. So 
death anxiety kind of leads to sin in a very kind of orthodox formulation that death is the predicament leading to our captivity to sin. Wonderful. And then um, as you're also looking at the intersection of theology with psychology, how are we as individuals and as communities to be set free from this slavery to death? Then? Um, well, that, that's a great question. Um, and the way I frame it in the book is pursuing practices to simplify practices of gratitude. Um, the, the, the argument I set up in the book is that this death anxiety is heightened when we orient our lives around um, ownership or possession. When, when, I, when I try to um, claim life or resources um, as my own. And so it puts me in a very anxious posture towards loss or competition from rivals that I might be jealous about or competing against. Um, Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Don't put your treasures on earth where they're vulnerable to loss or decay um, because that becomes a very fragile, anxious existence. So, so in one sense, what I'm saying is in all that amazing. I mean, if obviously if you put your trust in wealth and that's, that's how you achieve a sense of uh, identity or stability. And then that is threatened like chronic unemployment or a disability. Um, then, then obviously your, your whole life becomes very fragile if it ever becomes threatened and that kicks off that anxious response. But so what I argue for the, the, the book uh, borrowing a term from David Kelsey is to have kind of an eccentric orientation toward life that my value, my worth comes to me as a gift from God. And so the resources I have, I don't treat them as possessions as much as I'm a steward of them. I'm grateful for these gifts and because I don't own them and I've received them as a gift in an open handed way that I become more generous, it changes the psychological posture instead of protecting my stuff. I can share it more freely because it's not mine. It's a gift. So that's the survive that helps on that survival anxiety. Instead of hoarding, we become more generous when we practice gratitude for the gifts of physical resources. But also on the self-esteem side, when I receive my identity as a gift, that my value or worth is given to me as a gift that I don't have to earn or perform for, then whenever I'm in my life, I'm not hitting the metrics of success. Whenever I, I experience failure or setback, uh, you know, and, and I'm not successful, that, that I'm not just buffered from the anxiety of, you know, like not having enough to pay the bills, but I also realized that my worth isn't contingent upon me always having the greatest job in the world, that I can, like, like there, it, it immunizes you from the shaming of a culture Losers. But if your identity is outside of those metrics of success, the prizes that the culture hands out to the, to the winners and the losers, then, um, then you have kind of an immunity to shame as well. So that's kind of how I, I, I kind of talk about it in the book, that we emancipate ourselves from the fear of death through these kind of receiving my identity and all my possessions, everything in life as a gift that helps me hold it light, more lightly and generously. Mm -hmm. causing me to not like cling on hold on for dear life um, but able to kind of treat things in a more open-handed way now i'll put it i'll say this though the where the orthodox focus more on this emancipation from slavery it, more ontologically like you are liberated from death not just psychologically you are liberated from death because of the spirit and that the spirit begins changing us, um, theosis, uh, we become more like God. And so I would say a weakness of my book is that I don't talk a whole lot about those kind of ontological implications, um, the, the, the focus in the Orthodox tradition on the transfiguration of Jesus, that we're kind of on this journey of divinization. Um, and so my, my approach is approaching more of our captivity to death more psychologically rather than ontologically. So I don't talk a whole lot about the spirit uh, in the book. And I would say that's a regret of mine. I wish I had spent more time on that. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, 
but but I would just say I'm approaching the fear of death more from this psychological anxiety. What do we need to do with our psychological posture that'll make us less anxious in the face of death? Yeah, excellent. And I'm grateful for your perspective. It's refreshing too. Um, basically, then, in the face of this existential predicament, how is the resurrection in particular? So you mentioned the Christus Victor there. How is the resurrection to be experienced as liberation from the slavery of death? I suppose it ties in with what you're saying there. Um, about, I guess people would see it um, maybe in light of the ego as they know it at a popular level versus what they know from Freud, for example, the mm -hmm. death to your ego and that common parlance. But do you have anything you'd like to add about the resurrection? Well, again, like I said, um, I think that's a weakness in the book because the, rex the resurrection is, is speaking to, so, so a criticism of just a purely psychological approach is that if you just approach the fear of death psychologically, then, then salvation tends towards the therapeutic, that, I, that I'm doing this psychological work to kind of receive my identity from, as a, as a, as a gift from God, I'm trying to practice gratitude. And let me be clear, the data is very clear on this, that gratitude um, and practices of transcendence are highly correlated with emotional well-being. So there is a, th that's nothing in an, in an age of increasing anxiety and depression and addiction and suicide, the, these therapeutic gains from these practices of gratitude and transcendence, receiving your identity as a gift over and over and over again from the God who loves you and sees you and knows you, knows great mental health benefits there. But in many ways, then you could say, but it's still at the end of the day, there is your ultimate death. And doesn't that ultimately at the end kind of trump any sort of therapeutic gain that you might have that maybe you can practice this gratitude and thankfulness all the way uh, to the grave, but still that's defeat from the Orthodox perspective. And so to me, that's kind of where the resurrection steps in. So I don't want to just reduce the resurrection to a, a mere therapeutic metaphor, even though that metaphor is very powerful. Um, I, I do, I do think that the resurrection signals a kind of a crack in the universe that, that, that that's where our hope is, that the universe isn't a bounded physical system that is just tending towards death. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, there has been a crack in the universe where, the, where life has begun reinserting itself. The spirit has been given out, poured out. And so because of that reconnection through the resurrection, um, that death is defeated, not just therapeutically, but also ultimately. Um, and that's to me where I would rest in the resurrection. Yeah, brilliant. I think that ties in nicely with um, obviously St. Paul, but also Father Schmemann, the Orthodox theologian. He wrote about that particular issue as well. Um, so aside from that, you've also written about Johnny Cash, which is really mm -hmm. interesting. So I'm a huge Bob Dylan fan. And uh, yeah. listening to a lot of Johnny Cash, mainly through Dylan, and uh, discovered your book, I found it very interesting. I find them both very interesting theological figures uh, um, and how they tie in with the American mythos and everything else. But I'd love to ask you then, is it, well, let's frame it this way. Saints and sinners all jumbled together. Um, why is this so significant? And uh, what spoke to you most deeply about Cash and his life? Do you want to speak with him? Yeah, so that, I, so that description of the book that the gospel according to Johnny Cash is how saints and sinners are all jumbled up together. I, I think we, I come at that in different ways in the book. One of them is just the theme of um, solidarity, how God is often found in the God forsaken. I think that's one of the great insights about the crucifixion of Jesus is that God is located among the God forsaken. So where, we, where do we locate God in the world? Well, God is the one hanging on the tree. God is been the one that's being oppressed persecuted tortured without cause and so that that navigational approach to the crucifixion is, is i think what you see in the music of johnny cash while he would, he would sing about all of these kind of kind of dark um things but in those locations 
we find experiences of grace. And so to me, that speaks to one of the reasons my tra- I was attracted to Johnny Cash is my own ministry in a, in a maximum security prison and how you would think that would be a very dark place um, where wicked people are, you know, shoved out of society. But the opposite's true. Like I've discovered God and have experienced God more intimately in a prison than I often do on Sunday morning sitting in my church. And I think Johnny Cash's music explores that interesting paradox where God is found in unlikely people and places. Um, and I think the other aspect about that is that is the saints and sinners all jumbled up together is that I think we often when we look in the mirror, see that reflection staring back at us, that we aren't just demons or angels. We are mixtures of light and darkness. And so I also think we find in his music kind of an accurate portrayal of ourselves, that, that we, we have good, but we also have great capacities for evil as well. And so that, that music is um, honest, but very hospitable. It's honest about a predicament, but hospitable because it's true. And, and I can see myself in that music as well. Mm, wonderful. And um, can you maybe tell us about one or two songs that you look at in the book to really... Um, bring the point home about why he means so much in that respect. Yeah, one of my, uh, yeah, there's a couple. Uh, one is or perhaps my, one of my favorite songs of his that a lot of people might not know if they don't know Johnny Cash well, is um, Give My Love to Rose. And so and this came at a really interesting time in his career. It's early on in his career, he kind of recorded his first big great hits. Like he recorded Folsom Prison Blues. He had recorded um, I Walk the Line. But after he got those big hits, he kind of went through a songwriting lull. He didn't quite know who he was as an artist. And at the time, people like Elvis were dominating the airwaves with a lot of um, kind of love sick, love song, teenage romance kind of music. And so his producers at Sun Studios were pushing that music on him. And he just didn't feel like it fit. Like that's when you think of Johnny Cash, you're not thinking of teenage romance. like Heartbreak Hotel. That's just not his thing. Mm -hmm. So he was trying to figure out who he was going to be. And he had this memory of a concert he was doing out in California where a guy came up to him. He had just been released from prison, but he didn't have enough money to get back home to Louisiana, which is a long way away, if you know anything about American geography. All right, that's that's like a 24-hour car ride. And he can't get back home. He doesn't have any money. He's an ex-convict. And so he tells Johnny Cash after the concert, because he knew Johnny Cash was going to Louisiana uh, for a show. He said, hey, if you see my wife, you know, give my love to her. And the heartbreak of that request, that here is this guy who's penniless, he's a convicted criminal, can't make it home. So he writes this song called Give My Love to Rose around this kind of theme. And so this ex-convict has been let out. The narrator of the song finds the guy dying down by a railroad station and he goes to him and he says, listen, in his last dying breath, gives him his money. He says, if you see my wife, give my love to Rose and he dies. And so this is a really, really sad song. It doesn't have a ton of commercial appeal, but I love this song because if you know Cash's biography, this was the song where he kind of realized this is the kind of thing I want to write about. These are the stories I want to tell about people on the margins of society, the people that don't have a voice. And he devoted his whole career to singing music that way. And so I love that song because it illustrates that theme of solidarity with Cash, how he would speak up for the people that have been forgotten. Um, And and I would would lump in here examples of that, his live uh, live concerts in prisons and the way those concerts signal that solidarity with the incarcerated um, as well. So his prison concerts, all of them, not just the songs, but the location where they were sung, that he went inside a prison and nobody had ever done anything like that before. Um, to me, that, those concerts and that song, Give My Love to Rose, I think kind of illustrate what I really, why I was really attracted in Cash and why I think there's a lot of theological richness in what he does. If the gospel is looking for God on the margins, then his music is a great witness. Wonderful. Thank you, Richard. So um, 
As I was saying there, I'm a big Bob Dylan fan. I've written a few essays about Dylan myself and about uh, Bruce Springsteen because I've been so oh, yeah. enamored with them. Um, are there any other very idios- idiosyncratic figures, maybe from popular culture and music or any other uh, medium that you find particularly interesting, like Johnny Cash, maybe that you'd like to write about sometime? Well, you know, a lot of people um, have found a lot of interesting resonances with uh, modern, um, like, R&B and trap music. Uh, that might be an unlikely location, go from, like, trap music, <laughs> R&B music to Johnny Cash. Yeah. But, but, I, but I do think they're doing a similar thing because the trap, I don't know if your listeners know what trap music is, but it's a version of kind of hip-hop music, and it originated in the South and has become one of the most popular forms um, of that genre of hip hop. Um, but the trap is kind of a drug infested like neighborhood or house where lots of bad things go down. But the, but the word is also tragic in the sense that those locations become traps. And, and so a lot of that music is again, music speaking from the despair um, and from the perspective of the margins in society. Now, this is now an African-American experience, but it's not dissimilar. When Cash was singing about poor rural white people, a lot of the trap music is singing about poor urban black people. Both musics, though, are expressing the perspective and the despair and the struggles, but also the grace that can appear uh, in those marginal locations. Um, you know, another interesting group, I don't know if you're familiar with Drive-By Truckers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so they're a very interesting group, too, that's, that's singing Southern rock, but they're singing it with a heightened political consciousness. And, and I think they are a really interesting band uh, to spend time with as well. Yeah, good stuff. I think that's a, an especially important um, message now whenever things have become so polarized or fragmented or whatever way you'd want to look at it that people can unite around art amongst other things Mm -hmm. um so next just to take it back to your own life story can you tell us a bit about your own background and some of the key events and movements in your life that have helped form the man that you are oh man (laughs) well that's it yeah so uh yeah i think there were a couple different things I, i grew up in a um a conservative kind of fundamentalist uh, denomination called the Churches of Christ, which I don't think has a big footprint in the UK. Um, but if you think of kind of American conservative fundamental churches, then you got a good sense of kind of who we were or whatever. Um, what's interesting is I have this really interesting relationship with my conservative upbringing because a lot of people, a lot of the stories you will hear of people growing up in movements like those um, are pretty tragic. You know, they, they, they felt abused or um, they found the theology toxic. I never felt it that way. I, I, even though I kind of moved on in my theological journey, uh, I look back on those small, that small community as being one of the, a, a really beautiful time in my life. Um, even though I, I disagree theologically on so many different things now than, than the child, the the church of my childhood. Uh, um, That's that. Those are the people that introduced me to Jesus. And still to this day, my church tradition, the church of Christ, if you don't know anything about them, I guess the Orthodox will resonate with this is that um, it was a tradition that um, you couldn't have any instruments. And so we sang four part harmony out of hymnals. So we saw we sang old songs like you know um, Amazing Grace and um, you know I'll Fly Away and I don't know if you guys know any of those songs. But I know these that. Old, I like them. Old, these old guys. Well, they, you know, here's the thing. Go back to Johnny Cash. He recorded a, a whole album late in his life called My Mother's Hymn Book, and it's just Johnny Cash and a guitar singing these old gospel standards. And so those songs now. The difference between his experience and mine is he was Baptist, so they had instruments. We were Church of Christ. We sang four-part harmony. Mm-hmm. All that to say is that that is still today my love language with God. Like, I love the music that comes out of the contemporary Christian 
worship industry, Hillsong and all of that, Bethel and all that. I like, I like those songs. I'm not being judgmental, but if you really want to move me to tears, an old gospel hymn moves me. Hmm. Anyway, so that's where I began, you know, but around high school, um, I, I started having a lot of questions about the theology I was raised with. I think two of the big questions I struggled with in high school and college were like hell. Um, like, like, uh, is God going to send people to hell forever and ever and torture them in, in the flames of perdition? So I began asking questions about that. But the, the, the big heartache I had growing up was the problem of suffering and pain. Um, like the Holocaust was just something that horrified me. And this, and how God could allow such evil to happen. That's still, I would say, the, kind of the, one of the driving theological questions I have that still keeps me up late at night. And so asking questions about the Jews during the Holocaust or the status of non-believers kind of began propelling me in my young adulthood to kind of a more inclusive, um, I guess people would say a liberal or progressive Christian trajectory. So I started drifting away from the conservative view of my youth. Um, and, uh, and it, I think it was, I don't know if there was an event that caused that um, as much as it was a slow burn. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't recall a big traumatic moment or a, or a day where I just had this, the light bulb going, but it was just kind of a slow burn where, um, I don't know, it, it was just for me, I think very early on, I just had this fundamental conviction that God is love and that, that those three words should be the filter for everything. And that if anything drew me away from that conviction, like if I was going like, God is loving, but, mm -hmm. you know, like if I, any qualification, I get really suspicious about that. God is loving, but, um, that, that I kind of rejected it. And so I think once I kind of said, you know, that's going to be ground zero for me, um, then it took, you know, decades for me to just filter everything through that lens and kind of chase down the implications of all of that kind of stuff. Um, but then I would say recently in the last 10 years, I was kind of on this progressive liberal journey. Um, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with deconstruction, you know, deconstructing your faith, kind of asking Derrida. questions. Huh? Derrida, people like that, is it? Yeah, yeah, but people have used that term in America to kind of talk about people who kind of came out of uh, conservative evangelical Christianity, that they, they, they begin kind of asking questions about that narrative. So maybe they grew up believing in a literal seven-day creation, mm -hmm. but they begin to, quote, deconstruct that by, by trying to reconcile scripture with science. Um, they, they might have been taught that um, God will send people to hell for all eternity, but they begin questioning that. And so they deconstruct those views. And so in America, post-evangelical communities, the word deconstruction, it's similar to Derrida, but it is kind of a questioning of some prior fundamentalist conservative beliefs on a journey to kind of a more tolerant, inclusive, scientifically literate Christianity. So a lot of these people that are what we would call post-evangelicals, they came out of evangelicalism, but they now have more liberal political or um, uh, theological positions um, have gone through a process they call deconstructing their evangelical past. So I would say that I had been on that journey from my, my, my childhood. Um, but lately, my work in the prison, and also I worship with a, a community that's very economically marginalized. A lot of homeless people go to my church, uh, people in the margins of society. That my, spending time with incarcerated populations and the poor and the homeless in my town has gone through kind of another phase of my journey um, where, where I'm trying to, because one interesting paradox is about progressive Christianity in the United States. I don't know how it is where you are, but progressive Christianity begins to put social justice on the front burner. It's all about oppression. Yeah. And so that was what drove me to the prison. And that's what drove me to worship at this church with the homeless, right? This social justice impulse. 
um, that Christianity is all about just elections and um, oppression and activism and that kind of thing. But then when you spend time though in prisons or on the, on, or with homeless people, one of the things you discover is that the, 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 the spirituality, the Christianity you find there, and not just in America, but globally, when you go to the margins of your society, that there's a very much a charismatic kind of Pentecostal spirituality that you see there yeah. where, um, so I came into those spaces with a lot of this deconstruction happening. You know, the gospel is just about social justice, but then I go into these spaces and then my friends are talking about, well, miracles and uh, the devil and the, you know, and they're dancing in the aisles with very charismatic praise. Mm -hmm. And so that has been the latest journey of my life is, is kind of coming in as a skeptical, liberal, social justice minded Christian, learning to embrace the charismatic spirituality of the prisoners and the homeless people that we worship with every week. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's a little, some of the, some of the moments of my journey. Yeah. Wonderful. And is there any person or persons who've been especially inspirational or influential for you? You know, I mean, I like to tell my wife that all my best friends are dead um, in, the <laughs> sen in the sense that um, it's all authors. You know, a lot of it's been yeah. authors. So, I mean, there's been significant authors. Like, so when I talked about this idea that God is love and I was going to filter everything in my theology through the filter of love and my early questions about hell, like, so probably the very first significant author in my life was um, the Scottish novelist and writer George MacDonald. Mm -hmm. And so George MacDonald is, was huge for me early on because here was somebody who was just unapologetically privileging the love of God. So he was a big, he was a really big part of my, my early upbringing. Um, but I, you know, I had a series of mentors that, that spoke life into me at various points. Like, um, like in, in college, I, I had a professor named David Keller and my friends and I were debating um, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, you know, and, and we were trying to puzzle through, you know, because we were fundamentalists. And so we were puzzling through the proper way, you know, this very legalistic, proper way to take it, you know. And so we had the, we were debating this and we brought it to Mr. Keller and said, you know, Mr. Keller, like, you know, who, who, who has it right? Is this the proper way to take the Eucharist? Like it was some sort of magical ritual that you had to execute properly or the spell would like blow up in your face. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he looked at us, which is great confusion. Like what, what? And he says, he says, I don't think the Eucharist is a rule to be followed, but it's a story that's supposed to break your heart. And, and obviously, I, you know, that's, that was like, man, 30 years ago, I heard that. And it's still with me because it, took, it just knocked me out. The, the, the kind of fundamentalist rails I was on, he just knocked me completely onto a different track. And went like a story that breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he opened up this whole vista that the spiritual life is not just about rule following a God who gave you this rule book called the Bible, but it is instead a narrative, a drama, the poetry of the, of the faith that is supposed to just pick you up and enthrall you and captivate you and break your heart. And um, so, so there, there were mentors like D David Keller throughout my whole life that kind of, kind of just gave me a bigger vision mm -hmm. um, of, of what, um, but I would say the big influences now, like I said, are the inmates out at the prison, you know, that they, they have become the most significant voices in my life. Um, and the biggest encouragements in my life, um, which is interesting, right? Like, like my spiritual mentors are incarcerated people, but mm -hmm. that's, that's the way of things. Excellent. I guess that brings us a uh, nicely to one of your earlier books Unclean. Meditations on Purity, mm -hmm. Hospitality, and Mortality. So you look at the idea of I desire mercy, not sacrifice, echo in Hosea. Um, you say that Jesus defends his embrace of the unclean in the Gospel of Matthew, seeming to privilege the prophetic call to universal justice over the more Levitical pursuit of purity. And yet, as we're aware, the tensions and conflicts um, between holiness and mercy 
aren't necessarily so easily resolved. Often it seems that the psychological pull of purity and holiness tempts the church into practices of social exclusion and a Gnostic flight from the world into a kind of too spiritual spirituality. Can you tell us a bit about uh, why you think this is and how you think Jesus offers another radical way? Yeah, so, so Unclean was kind of a deep dive into the psychology of disgust and contamination. Right. So there's the title unclean. Mm -hmm. And, and what I try to explore in the book is how not just Christians, but human beings across the world tend to reason about sin and therefore sinners in the idiom of pollution, contagion, contamination, uncleanliness. And so what happens is we, import this psychology of disgust and contamination which evolved to regulate food how we feel about food and we feel disgusted by contaminated food but what happens is we take that whole psychology and it's very distinctive that's the other thing is it's a very distinctive psychology we take it and we import it into the moral uh, relational and spiritual realm and so we begin seeing human beings or certain behaviors as pollutants or so there are unclean people now and they're unclean because they're they're more they're moral infractions so in the gospels you see jesus uh violating these purity taboos by associating with uh, or embracing the unclean. So he eats with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes. Uh, we see him touching uh, lepers. So he violates all these purity taboos. And one of the scriptures, when he's questioned on this practice, one of the scriptures he cites to justify his actions is Hosea 6.6. 6. And Hosea 6.6 6 says, go and learn what this means. The Lord desires mercy and not sacrifice. And so the book is this exploration between this tension, between this uh, drive towards mercy and hospitality and embrace of the unclean, like Jesus does, versus this countervailing tension of sacrifice, which harkens to the Levitical code, the, the purity code that that we should quarantine ourselves from the unclean and that these are two kind of almost rival approaches to the world, the quarantine approach, the purity approach, or the crossing over and embracing the unclean that you see Jesus doing. And it's not hard to see that you can't do both of those, you know, at the same time, you're either going to quarantine or you're going to embrace and, um, and so Jesus says, I'm going to embrace. So go and learn what this means, that what God wants is the embracing of the unclean. So that book is just about that psychology and, the, and, and how we're often tempted away from Jesus' embrace of the unclean by all of this purity, contamination psychology that gets brought into the spiritual life as we consider people, you know, sinners as unclean and don't want to associate with them. And so churches are always tempted into this withdrawal from the world. And, and we are the saintly saved and you are the unwashed, unclean sinners. That church is always tempted into that um, removal um, where Jesus is saying, no, no, no. The, the holy person, and this is paradoxical. Psychologically, it's paradoxical. The holiest person is the person who is hanging out with sinners and prostitutes. Like that doesn't compute, but that's what Jesus is saying. Holiness is being like I am, which is touching lepers, embracing prostitutes and sinners. Excellent. And um, do you find, as you said, there are not just Christians are prone to this. Do you find that in a post or anti-Christian even society that this disgust manifests itself more along political or ideological lines? Oh yeah. So like I said, I, I was kind of doing a deep dive into the way the purity psychology 
um, manifesting Christian communities. But the but this but this purity psychology again is a universal psychology. It, all it seems to innate for us to reason about good and bad in the idiom of purity. Um, and so there's always purity impulses at work wherever you see good and bad discussed. So for example, like, so, so there's been a lot of um, pushback on like evangelical purity culture. And so evangelical purity culture in the United States is focused a lot on sexual purity. And so there's lots of been books written about how this purity culture, this, you know, don't, don't have sexual relations before marriage has had toxic effects upon the psychology of young women and young men, but mainly young women who carry the burden of maintaining their virginal uh, purity. And so you can see that purity ethic imported into a certain sexual ethic that certain, you know, sexual practices are sinful. But you see it also, though, a lot of people have been pointing out how there's, there's purity psychology at work in, in left-wing uh, progressive activism, where if you are not sufficiently, you know, on the side of the revolution, mm -hmm. and that you are expelled from or shamed out of, you know, the community. And so that there is this progressive, liberal, activistic kind of one-upsmanship where you're constantly trying to demonstrate your ideological purity or your perfect adherence to, you know, not being complicit in any oppression. And that if you violate that in any way, if you don't perform your liberalness or your progressiveness um, perfectly, <laughs> <laughs> then you're then you're kicked out of the cause as um, being a problem, you know, mm -hmm. and and so it's the same. But again, it, it's just the liberal version of what they consider good or bad. So, but in, on the so for conservative evangelicals, it's it's a sexual thing, but for liberals liberals and progressives, it'll be more about a, being complicit in oppressive structures. So if you're complicit at all, you're out. You're a bad ally you know, you're, you're uh, not sufficiently woke enough. So there's been a lot of writing on kind of the progressive liberal purity culture. Um, and I'm sure you see versions of that in the UK as well. Oh yeah, definitely that cancel culture. Um, Abdu Murray, that was a friend of Ravi Zacharias, wrote a, a really interesting article about this the other day, about how he, him coming from um, honor shame cultures, he could see the same mechanisms at play. So it's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I would just say it's just a, it's just a it's just a part of the natural human. Since we're always reason about good and bad in the idiom of purity, the, the temptations of that psychology of fear and contamination is is going to haunt everybody across the board. We all deal with it in some way or another. Mm -hmm. And do you think then um, that it's it's all um, mercy? Or do you think, well, I'm not sure you do, I think it's a both and, but there is a proper place for purity and what would the proper place look like? Or would you like to give an example of that? Yeah, no, I, some of the pushback I got on unclean, you know, you always wish you'd, like, it's the same pushback where I talk about the slavery of death. Like there were things I wish I'd put in there that mm -hmm. I didn't. So when you read unclean, it, it is a very liberal message that, everything is mercy, you know, that, you know, so, so it's very dismissive of purity and it goes all in on the call to mercy. Now, to be clear, remember, I'm the guy who said, I filter everything through the prism of God being loved. That, that, that I, ha I have because of pushback on the book begun to rethink where, where holiness and, and uh, impurity fit into this life of love. Mm -hmm. and, and so one of the things I would say about that is um, that, that purity or holiness is the kind of um, discipline that we have to cultivate to like love each other well. Okay, so give me, I'll give you two quick examples. So let's say I wanted to be present 
let's say I wanted to do work in the area of sex trafficking. So because of my social justice impulse, I want to be involved in sex trafficking. Well, let's say I'm going to be working in red light districts. I'm going to be working with sex workers. Well, as a man, I can't be in those spaces unless I have a sort of integrity about me. Mm -hmm. that, that, that I'm not going into these spaces of, of uh, sex work with ulterior motives, right? Mm -hmm. With illicit motives. I have to be pretty sexually pure so that I can be completely other oriented. So I wouldn't look at another woman, a sex worker, let's say you're trying to minister to um, in a consumptive way for my own gratification. Mm -hmm. And so holiness to me, sexual holiness, isn't about like fearing that God is going to condemn you to hell because you're being naughty. It is rather a matter of sexual integrity so that I can be available to people. And, and, and listen, we don't even have to get involved in the area of sex work. I mean, if you just look at the Me Too movement and, and there's just men behaving badly, that I work as a college professor with female colleagues. Um, I work with a lot of female undergraduates as a psych, psychology majors in, psych, in, in the U.S. Are, are mainly women. So almost all of my students are college-aged women and I'm in mentoring relationships with them. And so for me, holiness isn't about being a prude. It's not being a Puritan. It's not being anti-sex. It is, though, having enough integrity that when I'm dealing in cross-gender interactions, that those women feel safe, right? That, 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 that I don't approach them as a means to satisfy my own sexual desires. Mm -hmm. And so to me, purity, sexual purity, becomes a form of love. It allows me to love somebody well. Um, another example is with uh, substance abuse. So I, as a psychologist, um, you know, we deal a lot with people dealing with substance abuse. But if you're going to like minister to addicts, then obviously the degree of self-discipline about your own substance use is necessary. Otherwise, you would begin using substances as well. And so again, to, to be available to, to those people, um, one has to have a certain degree of discipline about oneself. And so that, to me, the idea of integrity or purity or holiness or even self-discipline and self-control, to me, the, the, those, are, those terms have been so, we, we, we tend to see them as so problematic in a, in, a, in a culture, you know, that that's all you're being, you know, conservative or fundamentalist, God, God is pleasure hating or denying but if you really think about it the way i've described it you realize no no those are the things that cause us to be to to love each other well because if i can't control my sexual impulses if i can't control my temper well then i want to be an awful human being i, I want to abuse people i'm going to hit my kids I'm going to have affairs i'm going to make passes at women when they don't want me to make passes at them i'm going to develop an addiction that can, can traumatize my family. Um, uh, you know, it, it, when you think about it that way, then, then suddenly holiness and purity is a way of kind of reducing your harmful footprint on other human beings. And then suddenly you're like, oh, okay, if that's what you mean, then holiness makes complete sense. So that's just a little, little kind of ramble about kind of where I think holiness and love go hand in hand. You can't love unless you're sufficiently holy because if you're a basket case or <laughs> toxic, then you're just going to hurt people or you're going to be so self-absorbed. Like if you're so unwell, then any relationship with you is going to be fundamentally consumptive. You, you, you're going to take and take and take and you have nothing to give because you you know you're 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 in such a damaged location and that's fine if you are but but being able to manage oneself well is correlated with your ability to be increasingly available to help other people um so that's one way to think about it 
No, oh, excellent. Thank you for that. It's lovely detail. So, um, just I don't know if this is going to be a sharp enough question, and you don't have to take it, but I'll, I'll just put some ideas out there and see what you think. So, um, one thing I've been worried about recently is the sickness of society itself. So, um, Nancy Piercy in her book, um, she talks about the influence of people like Hegel on our modern worldviews and postmodern worldviews, and uh, this materialist determinist view of history which seems to trap us in patterns of disgust, perhaps. And um, René Girard would talk about, obviously, the, the scapegoat. And I would fear that once you don't have the theology, you have to like localize evil and scapegoat certain groups and stuff. And then there's no exit, as it were. And um, it's, I see that in America and over here. And um, I'm just wondering what, what you thought about that. Do you, do you find that to be the case? or do you see Yeah, yeah. I actually write about this. I wrote a book about the devil, actually. Um, it's called, it's, really? called, it's, called Rob, it's called Reviving Old Scratch, uh, Demons and the Devil for Doubters and the Disenchanted. So I wrote a whole book about the devil. So Reviving Old Scratch, Old Scratch is an old uh, Southern name in America for the devil. So in the South, it was just an idiom called old scratch. And so that's where the title comes from, old scratch. But, but one of the arguments I make about in, in that book is the one you're making, which is when, when, when you reduce the struggle for good and evil, um, it, it could be May, Hegel, it could be Marx, but when you reduce the struggle for good and evil to materialistic terms, then the then your your fight against evil reduces to a fight against other human beings, um, and I think you're seeing that increasingly as our political discourse becomes more polarized. Um, so for us, it's Republicans and Democrats. For you guys, it's you know Labor um, and uh, the Tories, right? Like like you begin increasingly seeing those other people not just as people of just different political opinions, but actively wicked. Um, they, they are evil people. And once we moralize our, once we overlay our, our political discourse with the language of evil, then that, that's a really dark, um, uh, that's gonna take us into a very dark place. And I think we're seeing the consequences of that. It's very dehumanizing. And I think that's my great fear is that we're losing our ability to see people who differ from us as human beings. Um, and so one of the advantages of the language of Satan and the language of what, what is called spiritual warfare, where Paul says in Ephesians, our battle isn't against flesh and blood, right? The materialistic fight for power, the, the, you know, the, the Nietzschean will to power. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the heavenly realm. That, that, that there is a kind of grace in believing in the devil because it suggests that all of us have been trapped in this, you know, in this game. Uh, we're all, you know, you, you, hey, Bob Dylan, he's good on this. Only a pawn in their game. Yeah. It's a great example of this. The guy who shot Medgar Evers, right? Yeah, he's evil, but, but there's a larger system. And that what we need to do is not scapegoat that guy as evil as – he did an evil thing, but to focus on the higher register. And so to me, that's what spiritual language does, language of the devil. It helps us locate our battle in a location where we can be – we can use the language of evil, but we can see how we're all complicit in it, how we're all vulnerable to it, how we're all pawns in a game. And therefore, there's the possibility of peace and reconciliation because, and this is good orthodox theology, what, what we need saved from is not from the, we don't need to be saved from the labor party. <laughs> we don't need to be saved from the Tory party. What we need to be saved from are those powers of sin and death and the devil that's the fight if we both can agree on that common ground then there a possibility for bridge building emerges mm -hmm. um because if, if it's 
But because if Marx is right or Hegel is right, that this is all just a materialistic struggle, then everything reduces to power and one group taking power from another group. And I think the witness of history is that you go down that path, there'll be blood. Mm -hmm. um, there'll, there'll be gulags. There will be concentration camps. That, you know, there will be scapegoats. Yeah. Um, so in this uh, spiritual warfare then for people who maybe aren't so sure, what are some of the weapons that we might use then so-called? <laughs> Well, I mean, so, so when you start talking about the devil or the spiritual warfare, you know, a lot of people, you know, can get really freaked out about <laughs> that kind of thing, you know. And, and, and one of the things I do in the book is I like, you know what, let's, let's, let's just kind of put a pin in that issue. Is the devil real or metaphorical? Let's just put a pin in that for a minute and just speak descriptively. Because the word Satan simply means um, opponent or adversary. And, and if, you, if you understand that, that, this, that the Satan is what is antagonistic to love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, if you think about the fruits of the Spirit, right? If, if, if there, are, there are so many forces in our world um, arrayed against the, the reign of God, right? God's kingdom coming to earth as it is in heaven. Then and then, or if you just think about in your own life, the, your inner demons, the, the, all the things that you deal with day to day to kind of keep your ship straight, that you know, our own addictions and compulsions and insecurities and our shames and all that kind of stuff, all that stuff that is causing us not to be the loving, gentle, peaceful, joyful person that God has called us to be. And if we just agree on, on describing all of that, then, then we don't even really talk about like why. Like, so if the language of Satan becomes descriptive rather than explanatory, because what everybody wants to do is debate the explanatory. Like, is it, is it a real ontological force or is it just metaphorical? I, but if we just go to the other side, just like, but at the end of the day, we're all still talking about the exact same thing, which is, I, I, Richard Beck, am not as kind and gentle as I should be for lots of reasons. And those reasons are the spiritual battle that I am fighting. Um, if you want to interpret that supernaturally or more materialistically, I don't know if it changes anything. Like, I'm still fighting that battle. Um, now, to your point, though, how do you fight that battle? I, I do think there's some common agreement there is that, you know, you're going to turn again to this eccentric posture I talked about earlier. We're going to, um, Anne Lamont, um, who's a Christian writer in America, she says the three great prayers we always pray are thanks, help, and wow. And so we pray prayers of help, right? We turn to for divine aid and petition, like we surrender that to God. We also help people. Um, there's there's two, there's all kinds of tools to fight, you know, kindness. So, like, for example, for me, one of the biggest tools about fighting the spiritual battle in your own life is like not believing your own press. So if people say to me, you know, Richard, are you a good father? I'm like, I'm not the person asking if I'm a good father. You should ask my kids. <laughs> Um, am I a good, am I a good ally? Well, I, I can't answer that. You should ask people who are marginalized if I'm a good ally. You know, so there are other tools that we can use where we don't just have to appeal for help from God, but we can, we can also practice like tools of self evaluation and self introspection to kind of tease out where we've kind of deceived ourselves. Because that's one thing the Bible says about the devil. The devil appears to us as an angel of light. The devil is also going to, the devil will probably appear to you in the guise of your own virtue, mm -hmm. your own positive self image, or in, in the image of the good. You know, most of us didn't wake up today with the agenda to be toxic people, and yet we are. Well, it's probably, we're probably being toxic because we're pursuing some vision of the good as we see it, and we have a lot of blind spots. So that's a long, I mean, that's a long conversation about kind of how we root out the seeds of evil in our own lives, especially when we have so many blind spots. But obviously I think the spirit 
and God is, is vital to that. Um, this is why I like the Celtic breastplate prayers. Like I love the Celtic breastplate prayers because they're like, man, we are in an embattled situation. So Lord protect me yeah. from all of these things that, that those prayers are wonderful expressions of prayers of help. Excellent. Thank you for that, Richard. Um, another book you've written, then very academic one, very rewarding though, is The Authenticity of Faith. Read Did you read it. that? Oh, I read some of it. I haven't finished oh, it God. yet. Yeah, it's, yeah, very, it's, it's, it's tough. <laughs> the varieties and illusions of a religious experience. So, yeah. <laughs> in this book, you describe as Freud's claim that faith is a form of wishful thinking and belief in God is a consoling illusion. So is Christian faith simply a form of wishful thinking then or a consoling illusion? Yeah, like I said, yeah, like I said earlier, my, my interest in psychology and Christianity um, has an existential uh, take. Mm -hmm. And so one of the great criticisms of, of religion comes from the existential camp. It originated in Freud, but he's not the only one that basically argues that people are religious because of existential anxiety. We were talking earlier, the fear of death, that, that the terror of a completely materialistic cosmos and the end of life or whatever, that, that is, that's so unbearable that we invent religion, mm -hmm. that there is a God in the sky that loves us and that there's going to be life after death and all of our loved ones will be there, that this religious belief is to use marx's term right and the opiate of the masses right it is a consoling drug that we take and and to me that it that was in my estimation that that remains a very potent criticism of religious faith for a couple of interesting reasons one of them is simply that um it, it's it practices that hermeneutics of suspicion it, it it, it basically takes belief out of the hand of the believer. Because if I say to you, no, no, I don't, I don't believe in God because I'm afraid. But if you practice a hermeneutics of suspicion, you'd say, well, that's exactly what we expect you would say, right? Like you, you it's a defense mechanism. You, you, that's the Freudian criticism here, right? You, your, your ultimate deepest unconscious motive is not accessible to you. So you're, you can't give evidence on behalf of yourself because you, your motives are the very question, right? Your motives are what we're putting under the microscope. Um, and so suddenly I can't defend myself because of the hermeneutics of suspicion. Of course you'll defend yourself because the alternative for you is unbearable, unthinkable. And that's a very insidious criticism mm -hmm. because it allows the skeptic of religion to always kind of play the adult in the room you know i have the courage to face a godless existence mm -hmm. you know and even though that is not a very good logical argument it's a very powerful rhetorical argument mm -hmm. so i've always felt the the power of that argument and so but, but what's interesting about the argument is that it's not an argument uh, for the existence of God. It's not even an argument against the existence of God. It's an argument about human motivation. Why do you believe? Do you believe in God for anxious reasons or for non-anxious reasons? Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about that is that's a psychological question. It's not a theological question. It's not a metaphysical question. It's not a question about supernaturalism at all. It's a question about motivations. And psychologists study human motivations all the time in the laboratory. So why don't we study that? So the book, The Authenticity of Faith, is about my explorations into that question. Um, is anxiety driving religious belief? Yes or no? And then how would you know? Like, that's the other question. How would, you, how would you know if it is or is not? What, what is the texture of a defensive theological posture versus one that would be more existentially open? Mm -hmm. And so the answer 
to Freud's question is yes and no. He, yes, he is correct. And I think we have to be honest about that, that there is existential consolation in religious belief and that we often do see fear driven religion. And we've often seen the toxic consequences of a fear driven religion. In fact, I would say the phenomenon of Trump in America is, is an example of a fear-driven religion because the person that can make, if your religion is driven by fear, then the person that can conjure up the most fear can push that religious population. Does that make sense? Like, like if your religion is about dealing with your fear and I can conjure up boogeymans like immigrants and Muslims and sexual minorities and does it make sense like i can make you really really afraid yeah i think uh, would that also apply for any sort of secular utopia where you, they would promise heaven on earth so to yeah. implementize the eschaton sort of thing so the same psychological mechanism would be acted out there yeah yeah no that's a good yeah that's a good criticism because i mean to act as if the secularists don't have their own defensive posture mm-hmm um, so I agree with you. I think you, you can leverage it back. You can leverage it back upon the secular secularist as well. I agree with that. Uh, is there but, like, um, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, is there like an inevitability um, to religious belief as it were? And that does postmodernism and the questioning of meta narratives sort of the fact that it's, it doesn't last long that you get new Meta narratives and say like critical theory and things like that now new forms of Marxism that that shows that um, man is a kind of religious creature at a very deep level as it were. Mm-hmm. Is that I yeah? No, I think that's right. Um, uh, in, in fact, some of the the work that spurred on my interest in this area is by a guy named Ernest Becker who wrote a book called The Denial of Death, mm-hmm. and that's Becker's big argument is that is that we 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 create these what he calls cultural hero systems that create structures of significance and meaning to go back to what I was talking about earlier about the neurotic death anxiety, right? These hero systems provide us a solution to this neurotic death anxiety because they give us a, given the specter of death, um, they give us a route towards kind of cosmic, a sense of cosmic significance. And, And Becker's point is those, hero systems do not have to be religious they have often been religious Mm -hmm. but they can be they they're secular versions of that as well and i would say that's the you could see it in freud like freud's freud was criticizing religion um but psychoanalysis for him was like a religion like (laughs) like like he was it was his existential lifeboat it was the thing that was going to make him matter and he, he excommunicated people from the psychoanalytic community like Carl Jung or Alfred Adler. If they disagree with him, they were heretics and they were out. So there's, an, there, there, there's a scapegoating even there in the psychoanalytic community. You have to be a true believer in that system. If you question like the master, you were kicked out. So um, yeah, you see, yeah, so it's a universal dynamic yeah, that we're all existentially driven to kind of console ourselves. So, but the big issue then, is there any escape from that? And what would that look like? Okay, so it's not enough for the religious person to just say, well, you do the same thing. Yeah. Be leveling. But it still means we're all trapped by this death anxiety, the, the slavery to the fear of death, religious and secularists alike. So the Marxist is trapped and so is the Christian. So just pointing out the equivalency, for me at least, isn't enough. There, the issue is, is there a way to escape the, the existential predicament? Um, and, and that's kind of what my work in the slavery of death is about. How can you ultimately be emancipated from that fear? Um, and what would that involve? What would that journey be like? So in many ways, I don't know if you put this together, but I wrote the authenticity of faith first 
um, and the slavery of death is kind of my my sequel to that book because it's still dealing with that same issue of existential anxiety and defensiveness yeah wonderful um can you tell us then about William James and what drew you to his work and the religious types described in his uh, the varieties of religious experience? Yeah, well, what I use in the book, um, the varieties and illusions of religious experience. And so the title of the book comes from the, perhaps the two most famous books in the psychology of religion. Freud wrote The Future of an Illusion. And that's the book where he argues that faith and religion is an illusion, uh, uh, an existential drug. But the other most famous book written in psychology of religion is William James's The Varieties of Religious Experience. And what is very attractive about William James is that he is much where Freud had an ax to grind and he was going to put all of religion in this kind of wishful thinking box. All of religion is just a defensive reaction, wishful thinking. So it's very, like Freud was, reductionistic. James, though, and you can, it's, it's highlighted in the title, the varieties of religious experience. There are all sorts of religious experiences. And James is willing to admit that some of those expressions, of those, some of those varieties are defensive and fear-driven. He's willing to admit that. So he can agree with Freud on that. Yet you see fear-driven faith. But because he's not grinding an ax, he says, but you also see religious believers who are not anxious who practice a non-anxious non-defensive religious posture and so i pit james and freud kind of against each other so that's the title the varieties william james and the illusions you know sigmund freud and, and suggest at the end i vote i kind of ultimately vote for james and say that i'm not saying freud's wrong i'm not saying i think any honest believer can say you know I, that there is an existential appeal to life after death. I, I'm not going to deny that, but I don't want to reduce it to that. And that's where James is helpful because he's, he has a more, um, like, like for Freud, religion is a nail and a nail and, you know, it's just one thing, but James saw religion as a bouquet and some of it was nice and some of it was beautiful and some of it was not so nice, but it's a mixed bag. So I find James's view, the varieties of religious experience, uh, which is still a great read. Uh, people still read it to this day to great benefit. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And um, what are some of the interesting mo motivational dynamics among summer Christians and winter Christians, as you call them? Yeah, so, so one of the distinctions I make, uh, so, so to, to raise the question, how would you tell if your faith is being defensive or it's more existentially open? The words James used in the rise of religious experience was the healthy minded and the sick soul. Um, in my research, I call it the summer Christian or the winter Christian. And in, in, the, in the relevant distinction for our purposes is the summer Christian um, is focused on certainty and positivity. And so these are, when you see a Christian who cannot admit any sort of negativity at all, uh, any sort of discrepancy, any bit of shadow in their faith, like they are, they, are, they are drinking sunlight and eating cotton candy completely, that makes you start thinking that their religious belief is shutting out evidences you know, like, like it seems like they're blinding themselves, okay? But a winter Christian, or what Freud, uh, Sigmund, William James called the, the sick soul, is more willing to admit the brokenness and the dislocation of experience. And so biblically, this would be like the lament songs. The, they're, they're willing to say, I believe in God, but, you know, he seems like he's not answering the phone anymore. Like, it's, it's you know, I'm angry with him right they're more willing to admit or confess that life is more existentially mixed it's not all just cotton candy and rainbows and unicorns that there are dark days and god seems silent and the courage to admit that seems to signal less of a defensive posture 
and more of an open posture to say, yeah, life is a mixed bag, but I am mature enough. My, the, the, and you can see there that the, your faith isn't being used to quash or deny or repress or blind yourself to the hard things of life. You're willing to engage those things and let the hard things be hard. You still believe in God, you still believe in the resurrection, you still believe in heaven, but that doesn't mean that the death that you're facing is not painful, the loss of a child to cancer, that, that there's a lot of oppression in the world and the Holocaust still happen. And, and we look to heaven and go like, why? The courage to admit that lament is a good sign that your faith isn't being driven by opium, like an existential drug, but your faith is drawing you into the pain. Mm -hmm. And that's the one of the things that I would say to, to critics who say that religious people are all just wishful thinking. I mean, you, if you spend any time at all with a religious person, like their faith is often very disturbing to them. You're like, like, like if you, if you, my faith journey has not been one of all coziness. Yeah. I mean, there have been times when I've been like angry at God. There are things in scripture that confuse me. Mm -hmm. Like, like it has not been this, I'm just floating, you know, on a cloud. I mean, so Israel, the name Israel's was called the one who wrestles with God. That is more true to the religious experience that we are people that wrestle with God. We're not consoled by God all the time. There are times when God positively makes us mad. Mm -hmm. um, and so, the, so, so anyway, that, that, that is the winter Christian experience, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's a mixture of the positive and the negative, the, the, the praise and the lament that we give. We see ample evidence for that all through scripture. Oh, excellent. Yeah. It reminds me of C.S. Lewis too, who said he had to be, Brought kicking and screaming to Christianity, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And um, also, I think uh, the thing about the resurrection, I don't know if you want to address this, but um, it's obviously falsifiable historically. So whether Christ rose from the dead or he didn't, you know, and it's not contingent on what you think or how you feel psychologically, whether that happened or not. Uh, does that no. make sense? The other yeah. The yeah. Is a fact. And that, and that yeah, that's what I was saying, that Freud's critique has, is, has nothing to do with the, any ontological or historical issue. It's all about what motivates you. So, it's, so again, it's no proof. If, if, if Richard Beck believes in God because I'm scared of dying, let's say that's true, empirically, factually true. I believe in God because I'm afraid of dying. Logically, that has no implication on the resurrection or, or the existence of God. So Freud's argument isn't really about God at all. So this is why I was trying to say it's, it's just fundamentally a psychological question. Now, again, it's a very powerful argument because it, 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 it puts you as a believer on the defensive. You know, you're, you're scared. I, the rational atheist, <laughs> am, am the adult in the room. Right, right. That's not an argument against God. Um, but it is... It, it, like again, it has some rhetorical power, um, yeah. and you can kind of play this. You know, I'm I'm the courageous one here. The non non belief is courageous. Belief is belief is infantile or childlike. It's, yeah, you're right about that. That has nothing to do with the resurrection. It's more like calling names. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in one sense, you're just you're just. It's an insult more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um people make uh, another mistake in assuming that the two are the same, so the ontological question is the same as the psychological. They think that all so-called religious claims are equal, whereas I would argue, say, the resurrection has greater historical evidence than other claims. Like years ago, I was really interested in Islam. I was studying it and taking it very seriously. And um, it's a very different claim, like whether Muhammad received the Quran in a cave, that without all the eyewitnesses and stuff, even amongst different religions, they have radically different claims. Like uh, Christ was said to have 
been in crowds performing miracles of hundreds of people and there's all these eyewitness testimonies that uh, Richard Bauckham talk about and stuff like this. Um, which I, th I think it's just interesting from a secular move, for like an interesting secular move like that attack on your, char your psychological yeah. character. <laughs> Sorry if that's, if that's not relevant in any way. No, no, I, I think it's right. I think from a distance, you kind of just think, ah, oh, religion's religion, you know. Um, but but your, 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 your point is if you take a more fine-grained approach, th there's a lot of distinctions there that, that are worth considering. Mm -hmm. um, so just, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but uh, I would love to ask you about your forthcoming book because I think it's sort of, if you, if you want to talk about that one, because I think it touches on so much of this. And from what, the way I see it described, it sounds like you've been wrestling with Charles Taylor and secular rage is that right yeah that's correct mm -hmm. okay so it's called haunting magic eels recovering an enchanted faith in a skeptical age can you tell us a bit about that then yeah so the title hunting magic eels actually comes from wales so uh, uh, in wales there is a i can't pronounce welsh <laughs> name <laughs> i don't think is that, is that from the west? <laughs> so so in wales there is an island dedicated to a saint uh, and she is like the saint valentine's of the welsh um and she was became the saint valentine for the welsh this kind of patron saint of lovers because um her abbey on this island had a, a holy well which i've discovered are common like you just can't drive around britain without running into another holy well in the garden <laughs> And so there's this holy well there, and in the holy well were these magical eels. And that if you went on a pilgrimage there and you threw your hanker, like a token from your lover, into the well, and the eels um, uh, disturbed the handkerchief, that was a sign that your lover would be faithful to you for the rest of your life. And so all these people went there for this. So I was describing, you know, looking for this well. And so the hunting magic eels comes from Wales. Um, so it's kind of a funny little start to the book, but it's what the book is trying to talk about is how the world has made a long journey over 500 years. And Charles Taylor's book, as you mentioned, A Secular Age documents this, this, this journey from enchantment to disenchantment, a world of holy wells and magical eels and supernatural wonders and miracles to this more scientific, enlightened, secular, modern, materialistic, disbelieving age. And so the subtitle of the book, Recovering an Enchanted Faith in a Secular Age, is really what the book's about. It's about how we combat the forces of secularism and disenchantment, the rising tide of disbelief, um, that's happened, this, you know, happened more significantly in Europe and in the UK, but it's on the increase in America um, as well. So it is a book about kind of recovering a lived experience of God in a world increasingly tempted by disbelief and agnosticism and atheism. Mm, wonderful. I look forward to that one greatly. Um, just is there anything else then that you're working on aside from that or that you still feel a passion to get involved with in the future? Well, um, there's a part of this book that is coming out um, and I've given some other presentations on this topic um, about kind of um, how we achieve identity and self-esteem in this kind of secular age. And so I kind of want to write a I'm kind of exploring kind of writing a longer book about um, uh, faith and identity um, and how our well-being, I think the argument I want to make is, is how we're seeing as, as the world becomes increasingly secular, this associated rise of mental health problems. So increasing rates of depression, anxiety, suicide, addiction. And I'm going to make an argument that those two things are connected. That, that when the world becomes disenchanted, when we lose um, kind of a metaphysical ground of value and significance, then our mental health becomes dependent upon, um, well, the, 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 the hero system of the culture that we were talking about earlier, right? The neurotic. 
So life, the, what's interesting is that when disenchantment happened, when the world became secular, mm -hmm. the world also became neurotic. And those two things are connected. We become neurotic because my significance isn't given to me by God, but it is rather something I have to earn or perform for. And when we don't earn it or perform for it, we suffer all the shame and guilt and, and uh, that you see nowadays. So I kind of want to kind of make this argument about the relationship between God and mental health um, in a secular age. So that's, I don't know if that is worth a whole book, um, but I'm thinking about it. Mm, wonderful. Thank you very much for joining me, Richard. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Mark, it's been fun. Thank you for having me. Yeah, God bless you. Yeah, take care. We'll see you.